and welcome everybody to Long Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber and thanks for joining us. Big name Hollywood actress and entrepreneur Gwyneth Paltrow spent another day inside of a Utah courtroom as attorneys try to convince a jury that she's at fault for a ski slope accident. It happened seven years ago at Deer Valley Resort in Park City, Utah. Paltrow and Terry Sanderson, a retired optometrist who's now in his 70s, were traveling down a slope at the same time, and one of them crashed into the other. What's up for debate is which one, because each claims the other is at fault. Now, while Paltrow had minor injuries from the collision, Sanderson, the plaintiff, had multiple broken ribs and suffered a brain injury. In fact, he filed a lawsuit in 2019 and then Paltrow countersued. He's seeking at least $300,000 in damages on a negligence claim. And in her countersuit, Paltrow's requesting just $1 in damages and for Sanderson to cover her legal fees. Now, as attorneys for the plaintiff lay out their case for the eight jurors, medical experts gave testimony on what they think happened on that ski run. What I believe happened is that he was struck from the left side and that uh, forced him into the ground. It's, it's also been the testimony here that uh, Ms. Paltrow was on top of him at some point. So the combined weight of the two individuals slamming into the ground caused the fracture and the head injury. And I don't think it would be plausible that if he were running into her that he would have broken the ribs on the side of his chest. Well, to make sense of this, we actually had a chance to speak with Dr. Bio Curry Winchell, an urgent care physician, about the location of Sanderson's fractures and the impact that a concussion can have on the body even days later. You know, of course, we try to uh, re uh, reimagine, you know, a fall and how those injuries happen. But it's important to know that that fall still could have had other, you know, twists and turns that could have caused um, a fracture on the opposite side. So it, it's definitely plausible just because all of those intricacies to how an injury happens isn't always um, straightforward. When I see patients, you know, in the urgent care, um, you know, I'll hear stories of, you know, I fell down, but I was able to get back up. But then, you know, a couple of hours later, sometimes days, there are symptoms that are really representative of a concussion. And so sometimes when you think of shock, and, and those initial kind of injury and you get up and you're like, okay, I'm fine. That is just kind of part of sometimes our flight or flight, which is that autonomic where you're just trying to push through. However, concussion symptoms do not always show up right away. And so when we think of those such as fatigue, um, inability to concentrate, those kinds of things don't always present itself right away. And so it's something that you you really have to memorialize um, it, it just to make sure and kind of track where you're at or if it is a concussion. All right, let's break it down. I'm joined right now by my co-host, defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer, and our special guest, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. Nima, I'll start with you. It's good to see you. I think this is a battle of experts, right, when it comes to Sanderson's, in Sanderson's injuries. Do you think that's going to play out a certain way? I do. You know, obviously this is a ski crash case, but it's no different from a car accident. Essentially what you have is a dispute here. It could be a red light stop sign. But here what we're talking about is the slopes and who had the right of way. Sanderson is saying that he was downhill and we know that downhill skiers had the right of way. And we know that Gwyneth Paltrow is going to say, no, 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 no. I was down the slope and you crashed into me. She's going to have Eric, the Deer Valley ski instructor, testify. I think she's going to take the stand as well, and she's going to have family members. So two very different yeah. accounts of what happened. It's going to be interesting how the jury is going to sort through it. But having medical experts say that they can definitively determine that the she, he was hit, that's going to be big. Now, everyone agrees, Brian, that there was a collision. Again, the debate is just who struck who. Does it even matter that Sanderson was concussed? It doesn't necessarily matter that he was concussed, but as you kind of alluded there, it's about how he became concussed. So, yes, does he have to prove damages? A concussion and broken ribs is part of that. But in the opening statements from Paltrow, we saw that he could be found uh, liable if he's more than 51% liable to these injuries. And if it's just an accident, Paltrow may not be liable. People get injured in accidents all of the time. If his injuries are just so great because of this eggshell rule of him being in this state, but he hit Paltrow, Paltrow could still win. So concussion, not necessarily the ultimate decider, but how it happened is. I know we cover a lot of criminal trials, but as you can see, civil trials can sometimes be even more complicated and so much to deal with. And we're gonna talk more about it. And
Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily, everybody. Our coverage of the civil lawsuit against actress Gwyneth Paltrow in Utah continues now with an eyewitness account. Retired optometrist T Terry Sanderson and Paltrow are suing each other over a mid-slope pile-up that left Sanderson with some serious injuries. Now, the two disagree over who slammed into whom. Now, it's one thing to look at reports or medical records to determine the culpability of either party, but it is a whole other thing to actually be on the slope. And here's how a man skiing with Terry Sanderson's group that day describes the 2016 collision. Well, we were skiing down down um, the bend, uh, the, down the run, and then, and then I heard this, this, this yell, this, this, this scream, and then I looked over, and then about, you know, maybe one or two seconds, um, and then I heard the scream, and then, and then, and then I see this, this, this skier just slam into the back of Terry, and when, and she just slammed him. How hard? Very hard. He, he, I mean, very hard. And so Terry, he, she hits him right directly in the back. And so then, uh, then his skis are like when you're skiing, you're skiing like this. His skis, his skis actually the tips go out like this, and he falls face down. So he's he's kind of he's kind of spread eagle, and he goes face down, and, and Gwyneth's on the top of him, and, and they go down like this, and then Gwyneth hits him, and then bounces off and slides to the right about five or ten feet. That's some important testimony right there, but not the only drama that we've seen. You see, before the judge called the jury in on Wednesday morning, Paltrow's attorney brought up an issue that his client has with the proceedings, the cameras. Here's what he had to say before and after a short recess. Your Honor, we have a new camera pointed directly at my client right there on the right, which we understand is from the AP. This is a... a during the recess, I'll have the court representative, Tanya, take a look at how that camera's pointed and make sure that it's pointed at the lectern rather than at the council table. Uh, the camera that I referenced uh, was a violation of the decorum order. That's the second violation in two days. Directly, still photographer, directly on my client's face, already transmitted uh, nationally. So I'm mad. Uh, the, the decorum order we spent a lot of time on. It's the court's order. People are subject to criminal sanction, and uh, I, I want it to stop. I don't want to have to be the one raising it. I want them to comply. Hmm. So, Brian, let's go back to the case. In opening, Sanderson's attorney described his fall one way, but then their star witness seemed to describe it another way. What's the jury supposed to do with that? I mean, in a he said, she said, you're expecting that both sides are going to be consistent in their own stories, and then we figure out which one's more plausible. But when one side has different variations of their own story, that, I think, causes disruption in their case. Now, during opening statements, the, the attorney for Sanderson kind of put his arm on the right side, almost like, almost like a chicken bone, so to speak, and talked about falling on the side, and that made sense. I mean, I, I played college soccer. I bruised my ribs. I've got four or five different fractures. You fall on your arm on a hard surface, you can fracture your ribs. But here, the witness says it's more spread eagle, and, and Paltrow falling on his back makes me think, well, if you're spread eagle, falling in snow, whether it's packed or not, how do you get injuries on your right side? So that's a good point, and Nima, eyewitnesses, they're great, but obviously they have problems just like the, all, all of us. For example, the eyewitness is colorblind and has a story that changed over time because he said he got nervous to mix things up. I mean, how is that credible? Well, this is an important witness because we know that uh, Paltrow was going to rely on the ski instructor, right? So w w that was going to be an independent witness. And obviously, Paltrow's lawyers have been pretty successful so far. They've gotten the punitive damages stricken, no evidence of a hit and run. You got the recklessness stricken. So I thought the plaintiffs were really behind. I like them bringing an independent witness, not only because the witness is independent. They're saying, hey, guess what? The ski instructor didn't show up till several minutes later. He didn't even see any of this. Yeah. And Gwyneth Paltrow sat there for four minutes. She was silent. She didn't say a word. So well, we started strong, I think. That's the, that's the claim. we will be curious what the jury ultimately believes. We want to actually move right now to a different story because we have an update for you in the case of Zachariah Anderson, the man accused of killing his ex's new lover in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A jury found him guilty of all charges on Wednesday. 
Anderson faced first-degree murder, among other charges, in the death of Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. roughly three years ago. The victim was the new love interest of Anderson's former girlfriend, and she testified, along with their daughter, that Anderson would constantly spy on and attempt to stalk the couple. Now, prosecutors believe that Anderson killed Gutierrez at his own apartment because he was jealous. Investigators found blood in several areas of the victim's apartment and believe that a struggle took place, but I should tell you Gutierrez's body has never been found. Anderson will be sentenced in May.